So I had a choice this morning. I could either do a presentation or we could live stream April the Giraffe and just you know, see what happens. But I decided to end the presentation because the Wi-Fi is not up to April. Come on, there you go. Excellent. All right, so. What I want to talk about is uh, letting go of stuff. And I'm going to be doing a lot of live coding, so you'll have plenty of opportunities to laugh later on. So let me introduce this by just a little bit of history. Um, our story really starts on the other side of the planet in an island called Vanuatu, part of the Micronesian chain. And uh, people, the native people living there, Aboriginal people, um, have very, very little contact with the West. That's just to show you roughly where it is. It's just, there's New Guinea, Australia, Japan up there, Vietnam, just above it. Um, during the Second World War, it was obviously very strategic. Melanesia was invaded first by the Japanese. It was the scene of some of the uh, toughest fighting of the war and eventually was uh, occupied by the Americans. So first by the Japanese, then by the Americans, the natives got to see um, the West. And what they saw was um, people would come in and they would build these strips on the ground and put lights on them and build these towers next to them and people would talk on the radios. And when they did that, big things would come out of the sky and those things would contain other things, good things you know, food and tools and other boxes of things. And so when the war was over and everybody left, they decided that they needed to make these things continue to come. And so they actually constructed their own runways and their own control towers. And they actually held effectively religious ceremonies where they would simulate planes coming in to land in the hope that they would remind the gods that, excuse me, we need some of this cargo to come through as well. Okay? This is called a cargo cult, and it was actually made famous um, probably by Richard Feynman, who in a, a Caltech talk talked about, and I'm going to read this, in the South Seas there's a cargo cult of people. During the war they saw airplanes with lots of good materials and they want the same things to happen now. So they've arranged to make things like runways, to put fires along the side of the runways, to make a wooden hut for a man to sit in with two wooden pieces on his head as headphones and bars of bamboo sticking out like antenna. He's the controller. And they wait for the airplanes to land. They're doing everything right. The form is perfect. It looks exactly the way it looked before but it doesn't work. So, these people making a wooden hut someone sits in with headphones on. Now clearly, nowadays, you know, all of us are way, way too sophisticated to sit in little wooden huts with headphones on, right? <coughs> no. We all do it every day. We all sit here in cargo cult. We all do things because it worked for somebody else. In fact, the entire basis of process consulting is because people say, oh, this worked for me, therefore it must work for you. So we cargo cult all the time. And what I'm going to try and do today is just to show you three areas in which I think we need to start breaking away from the cargo culting of the past. And they're all to do with code. Um, this may seem a little bit like a commercial for uh, my GitHub repository. It's not really. It's just that I've been playing around with these things for a long time. And since I have more time on my hands after I kind of pull back from publishing, um, I've had this little explosion of ideas that I want to try out. So, first one is Quixer, which is a property testing framework for Elixir. Now, the idea here is that I wanted to play around, actually what I really wanted to do was play around with streams and generation. Um, but I also wanted to experiment with property-based testing. I'd never done it before. And I actually misunderstood what it was. And this is where the kind of cargo culting comes in. Because we all know that testing is good. And some of us actually do it. Um, <laughs> but the kind of testing we typically do is unit testing with assertions that say, you know, sort of do something, assert this is this, right? And I, I, I think that's a good idea. 
But I really enjoy testing, not because of the testing aspect, but because it makes me think about my code. It makes me think about my APIs. But that's only part of the thing. When you're doing functional programming, your functions have an implicit set of inputs they can deal with and an implicit set of outputs they can create. This is the domains and the ranges of our functions. So how do we test those? And how do we think about those? And that's where a property test comes in. A property test says, hey, I'm going to call this function 10,000 times. And I am going to give it randomish values. And I'm going to find out what the properties of this function are. So for example, you might decide to test to make sure that addition is, is that commutative? I can never remember which ones are associated with name. Whatever. Right? I'm going to test that a plus b equals b plus a for all integers. Right? And OK, a non-test, but it's still kind of like you know, interesting to do. When you feed that kind of thing into your code, what you're testing is your function is actually um, a good member of that function's domain and range. You can do property tests like this to say, I want an A and a B, which minimum value is always going to be one greater than whatever value you choose for A. And then I'm going to assert that A is always less than B. Not a big deal. Or I can say that I'm going to test uh, a struct person. And so I'm going to generate random person structs. And inside that random person struct, I'm going to have a name, which is a string that contains only ASCII characters, and an age between 1 and 125. So again, we're just generating values and doing it. And that was, for me, the entire um, joy of it, is this idea of generating streams of values. Um, but having done it, it actually changed my entire perception of testing. And it makes me think a lot more about my functions in terms of their domains and their ranges. And when I started thinking about streams and uh, generating things in factories, um, I came up with the name pollution for the actual um, uh, library. So if you actually ever need a stream of random values from some kind of, you know, that meets some criteria, pollution is your friend. Anyway. So that's one thing. Next thing, diet. I wanted to talk about code as a set of transformations or a set of transitions. Uh, I've been lucky enough to do a bit of teaching last semester. Um, I taught one of the first Elixir uh, classes at a university, uh, which was great fun. Really cool students who hadn't heard about things like version control and testing. But if you do do uh, a computer science course, the chances are pretty good at some point in the first you know, week, some professor will have drawn a picture on the board that looks something like this, right? This is how computers work, they will say. You know, we have an input, and it goes to the processor, and it produces an output, and then you know, maybe we'll actually store some stuff on disk somewhere and then bring it back up the next time we run the program, OK? So that's what our, our basic processor looks like. So let's tidy that up a bit. Now today, I mean, it doesn't look that simple. But we do have something that does look that simple. And that's what we're coding with processes today. We don't call storage storage. We call it state. But it's exactly the same picture that we use. We have a function. We take an input. It uses state. And it produces new output. And in fact, typically, we have this kind of more ladder-like picture where we have common state. And we pass that state between our functions. Now, those, that state can be passed back and forth to the same function over and over. And that's what we do in our gen servers. Or we can actually have that state that gets passed from one function to the next function to the next function. If you do Phoenix programming, then that's what you're doing with a connection plug. Yeah? You're just passing state between a set of functions. And that's a perfectly great way of programming. So I started thinking about this. When we do that, we also quite often have different sets of state. So each gen server, for example, will have its own set of state. And each gen server will be independent as it mutates that state. And then if we look at the individual mutators, individual functions like that, and look inside one of them, there's nothing to say that that cannot have the same set of mutations built into itself, right? So every function acts as one of these mutators, a transformer, and it contains nothing but a set of transformers. So I started thinking about that. You know, can we have 
transformations all the way down. So the first question I decided to experiment with is, can we write non-trivial programs using nothing but, and I set myself the target of one line, transformations. And I came to the conclusion that yes, we can. But it's stupid. <laughs> All right, you're you're un unreasonably limiting yourself in what you can do. So <clears throat> I kind of relax the constraint a bit. Can we write parts of programs as nothing more than one-line transformations? And clearly the answer is yes, because if you can do the first, you can do the second. But here, it starts to get really exciting. Because I think if you start looking at your code in terms of single line transformations, you will discover hidden patterns that you never knew were there. So I produced a little framework called Diet. Um, Diet because it actually consists of, you write a whole bunch of reducers, so ha ha. Um, and all you do in Diet is you define transformers. And a transformer is a function, or just an expression really, uh, that takes uh, a state and creates a new state. So we have basically input going to output. When I said it creates a new state, it actually creates two things. It can potentially update a state, it always produces a value. So there are two forms of a transformer, one where it just takes an input, produces an output, and the other one where it updates the state along the way. The input to each uh, trans uh, transformation is a pattern, uh, potentially with a guard clause if you wanted to have one. And our, f our pattern matches, it produces an output, and then Diet immediately looks at that output and says, does this match the input of any other transformation? And if so, it just runs that transformation. And it keeps doing that until it can't find a match. And when it can't find a match, that's the value that is returned from the sequence of transformations. So <clears throat> this is where I make a total fool of myself. <clears throat> so let us, um, let's try writing FizzBuzz, yeah? So oops, thank you autocorrect. Sorry about that. So we're just going to write a regular ellipsoid module. It's going to be a long morning if I'm going to type like this all morning. And we're going to use diet transformations. And now we're going to define a set of reductions. So let's assume that our input, I, I, you could just give the input being a number. I like to give inputs being a bit like a gen server message where you have the, the function that you want to perform and then any parameters. So let's have the function being FB for fizzbuzz, because I'm not going to type that in much of times. And I'm going to take a number. And I want to produce the, the, you know, either a fizz, a buzz, a fizzbuzz, or the actual number itself. So to do that, I need to know whether our number is divisible by 3 or divisible by 5. So what I'm going to do is recode this as a transformation to a fizzbuzz on our number, and then the remainder of our number by 3, and then the remainder of our number by 5. Okay? So that's a simple transformation. So now I'm going to start matching on that output pattern. So if I have a, uh, an input, created by that output that looks like that, well, then it means my number is divisible by 3 and divisible by 5. So now I just want to produce this buzz. I'm going to cheat a bit here. OK, if instead my number is divisible by 3, it's not divisible by 5, because that would have been tested by the previous clause, so it's going to be a fizz. 
If it's divisible by 5, then it's going to be a buzz. Otherwise, it's just a number. OK? So that's the series of transformations that I can write. And to experiment with that, we can actually run this code, if I remember to save it. All right, so I'll just go into IEX. And <clears throat> how do I run this code? Well, I have to have something that's going to step through these transformations. So Diet has something called a stepper. So I can say uh, S equals And I can give it the module. And then, in this case, nothing. I don't, I'll come on to what that does in a minute. So that's created for me a stepper. So now I can run that stepper and give it some input. So I'm going to say the result and a new state, we'll get onto that in a second, equals uh, diet.stepper.run. I'm going to run my stepper s. And I'm going to give it a number. So let's give it a number six. OK. Oh, let's just have a look at just the result and not the new state. So I'll just put an R at the end there. So if I give it six, it comes back with a number six. If I give it five, oop, it comes back with five. That's not right. What have I done wrong there? OK. I will show you a magic trick. If I say uh, diet dot debug my state, it doesn't work. Well, this is going well, isn't it? <laughs> Say what? I need the symbol of FB. Oh, yes, thank you. I'm an idiot. OK, let's do that again. All right, so we're going to, uh, we still have our stepper lying around, so I'm just going to run it again. You're absolutely right. The parameter I passed into it. I should have passed that in. Yeah? FB, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I also have to pass in the actual original state. There we go. <clears throat> this time it runs and gives me fizz, which is a multiple of three. Yeah? If I give it a five, I get buzz. If I give it 15, I get fizz buzz. If I give it 16, I get 16. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. OK, so that's just the basics, right? Let's do something slightly more complicated. Um, let's do something like run length encoding. So with run length encoding, what I'm trying to do is if I have an input that looks like 1, oops, one 2, 2, 2, 3, 4, 4, five, say, that what I want to do is to convert that into one, and then how many twos have I got? I've got three twos, and then a three, and then two fours, and then a five. Yeah? Totally pointless, but kind of even more interesting. So let's create code for that. So <coughs> def module RLE, and again, we're going to use our Transformations. So we start off, we have a list. OK, so we're going to RLE some kind of list. And we know just from experience that to run anything code a list, we're going to need an output list as well. So the next first thing we'll do is going to basically transform that into an RLE on our list and a result. Okay. Now, I want you to stop and just think about how you would write this code in something like a Ruby or a Python or whatever else, 
Right? And just think about how the code would actually involve with lots of if statements and everything else. Here we can just use your Elixir pattern matching. So if I match an empty list and I have a result, then our, our, we've actually finished and we just want to return our result. And that's actually a bug, but I'll come back to that in a second. If I'm going to RLE a list, and if that input list has the same element twice at the head, and I have a result. So then what I'm going to have to do is to replace that head with a tuple. So I'm going to come back and say, OK, so now I want to do is a RLE on a list that contains a comma 2, rest, and a result. Yeah? If I have a list that starts with A followed by a number in a tuple, then, and followed by an A, then I'm going to increase that number by one. Okay, and then finally, if none of those things are true, I'm just going to move the input to the output. So if I have a list that has an A and it's not match the, the current thing, then my result is simply going to be what happens if I RLE the rest okay now you all recognize the pattern we're recursing through a list so you all know that that means that our list is going to be in uh, reverse reverse order when we finish so just to save myself a bit of hassle I'm just going to do it the num reverse here extra square bracket on the last line. You're absolutely right. Thank you. Anything else? Just before I make a total fool? Okay. Okay. So, <coughs> let's go back and see if we can run that. So, I need to create another stepper. So, S equals, F. you know what? There we go. Uh, new RLE. You're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, that's probably. No, I've done an alias. I can't kill it now. Uh, C <laughs> lib slash RLE. There we go. Thank you. Uh, coding is so much easier when there's 100 people helping you. I really appreciate it. So, r comma s equals ds dot run, and we'll pass in one, two, three, three, four, 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 five, and just see what happens. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, look at that. And let's just have a look at the pure result here. So there it is, it's done the RLE. Now, the thing about that is, that's the kind of code that's trivial to write using a set of transformations. If instead I wanted to write that in just linear if then else style, right, I can guarantee you I'd get it wrong. And I know because I've tried, right? I can guarantee you there are edge conditions that I wouldn't think about. So there's another interesting thing here I'm trying to work out why my debugger is not working. Okay, I'll get back to that. You'll notice here that I'm actually keeping the full history of what's happening. I don't have to, but I chose to. And that means I can actually go back and see how I got to where I am. Yeah? So I can look back to the history and say, you know, at a particular step, I, this was my input, this was my output, this is the action I took. And that's kind of cool. So one last thing I'm going to show you, um, and I'm not going to live code it. You'll be very pleased to learn. Uh, where am I now? 35. Let's go to roughly 40. OK, so in my university class, we used Hangman as the uh, ongoing example. And in Hangman, we have a, a model 
which represents the game, and then we have a set of transformation, which are kind of the rules that apply to that game. You know, if this, then that. So if we were to write this using transformations, we would keep the model pretty much the same. So we just have a regular old Elixir class that represented our game, so the word to guess, the number of guesses so far, et cetera, et cetera. And then we would use the transformations, but this time, remember we had that diagram with the model and the transformations and we'd move from one to the next to the next? Well, that's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna tell our diet set of transformations that it's using a particular model. And inside the transformations, we're gonna make that model available as a variable called game. So then we can write our actual hangman game like this, yeah? The first thing, the kind of entry point, is where I say make move, and I give it a move. And the first thing I want to do is to say, have you already guessed that letter? So I'm going to transform that into a new tuple that actually calls the model to say, has this letter already been used? If it has, then we're going to issue a new tuple that says make move, move true, and so the result's going to be you've already used that letter. Otherwise, we're going to record the move. And record the move, uses this thing called update model, which is how you know you've changed the state. So we're going to update the model, and the new state is what happens if I call that model and say I've used this letter. And I'm going to return maybe match, because that's what I want to do next. I then go in and I ask the model whether or not this matches, and if it does, I'm going to do one thing, otherwise I'm going to do another thing. So you can see what I've done here is an entire list of single line transformations that are um, slowly working out what's happening with this particular move. And the result's going to come back and say you either, either already used it, it's a good guess, a bad guess, you've won or you've lost. And again, it's so easy to see, it's just linear code. So we can run that, I hope. No, I'm not going to run that. So given that code, we can run that exactly the same way that we ran our um, uh, previous code. So we can run it using our stepper, uh, and this time we're going to feed into it initial state for the model, and that's what that um, last parameter that I always had nil so far, that's the initial state. And that state is actually passed to a build function in the model, and the model uses that to actually build its internal representation of that state. So once we've got that, then we can just uh, keep calling um, our stepper, and inside those steps, our state is going to be passed in in that variable called game. And it's available to both the model and also to our transformations. And so when we use that, we can just play hangman, which is cool, right? So here's the interesting thing. There is a lie that we all uh, uh, go along with in functional programming. Okay, sorry, it's not a lie, it's a alternative fact, <laughs> that we have no side effects, right? Functional programmers, we code, we have immutable state, we have no side effects, and that's why we're so great, yeah? But it's not true. Think about this piece of code executing. Doesn't matter what it does, just think about how it executes. There's one critical thing that's being overwritten every single time anything executes in that code. Unbelievably important thing that we just take for granted. That's the program counter, right? Every time we write something that executes, we're actually mutating the program counter as it executes. Now, if that's not a side effect, I don't know what is. And that's what makes it so difficult to go backwards in our code because our code consists of nothing more than a side effect of moving the program counter forward. But if you were to write code like this, you'll see that you can actually keep all of those histories. So if I was running this game, and as I'm running this game, I keep a track of all of the transformations that I'm actually seeing. And part of the state of that stepper is a history of all the transformations. So I'm making my moves, and then suddenly I make a mistake, which I don't like. So can I do anything about that? Yes. I can actually go into my history and just delete the, the, transi the transitions that correspond to that state. Take me back to the clean state at the end of the third guess. 
And because that is then pure, there is no program counter involved, it doesn't matter, right? I can just then go forward as if the bad guess had never happened. I can fork the histories. I can clone my, my history into two separate channels. And then by doing that, I can actually run alternative futures and see which ones I like better. Or maybe I'm initializing a server and I have some complex initialization, some time-consuming initialization. So I'll do it just once, get the history to that point, and then fork off as many processes as I want, each with that shared common initial history. All right, this is a really powerful model. So I think it's, it's worth playing with it. Just simply the idea that I can actually just change history and fork history is fantastic. I also get some other side effects that are nice. I get single line of code reusability. I can be parallel. There's nothing to stop me running each of those things in a separate process. Um, I can actually live reload the flow and not just the code, which is, if you think about it, the transitions represent the flow through my program. And of course, I get world peace. How am I doing for time? What time? Yes being, yes is not the answer for how much. <laughs> Seven minutes, okay. We're gonna go quickly. All right, my last thing is servers. So, outside, the world is embracing services, microservices, this is the way to go, right? We're gonna rewrite all our applications as microservices. <laughs> We've been doing that for 30 years, yeah? And that's not a big deal, right? Fundamentally, a gen server is a microservice. And yet, is that what we do? Is that how we write our code? And the answer is no. Most of us do not think about writing code that way. Why? I think it's because the ceremony of writing a gen server is just too much. So, let's look at that a different way. Let's actually start writing some code. So I have a service running, where are we here, right? I have a service uh, that's already running it is a REST service. Well, no, it's not really. It's just a stupid service. And um, if I uh, call it, uh, localhost 4000, if I pass it a number, then it's going to go through an incredibly complicated computation. It takes about three seconds before returning a result. And so, in order to make sure it's actually operating, I've added some trace into my main window here. So if I call this like that, you'll see that it actually thinks for three seconds before returning, and that's a bit small. If I give it five, it returns 25, yeah? And if I give it um, seven, think, 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 ah, it returns 49, okay? So that's the service that I'm going to call. So I'm going to write some code now that's actually going to invoke that service. So, oops. That is just a simple Elixir module uses poison to go and fetch whatever the parameter is, and then just returns the body out of that. So if I go back into IEX, I beg your pardon? Missing do, but even that, failed to check the hex version. Failed to check the hex version? So you wait the requisite three seconds, it comes back to 25. You think to yourself, that is so cool, right? I've, not, I've got myself a module that does this, but it's a module, it's not a service. And this is something that is so universally useful, I wanna make it available as a service. So I probably wanna turn this into a gen server. Now at this point, you're gonna to have to go off and look at the gen server code. If you're an Erlang developer, then you'll probably bring in the standard gen server template, which I've actually checked, is exactly 128 lines long. If instead you're going to use Elixir, then you can look for an Elixir template for Gen Server, and the ones I found, coincidentally, is 32 lines long, which is two orders of magnitude, base two, smaller 
than the, the Erlang one, but it's still 30 lines of code, right? Which is ridiculous. So this is what we really should have to be able to do. If we want to create a gen server, I should be able to say use, okay? I want to create a named service. And that's it, and here's my named service. So if I come back over here and rerun this, or reload it, sorry, okay? So now I have a gen server, so I need to be able to run it. So the first thing I'm gonna do is say, fetcher.run, and now it's run that code as a, as a separate PID, and I say fetcher.get5, and now it's calling our gen server, and it comes back. So you may not think there's actually a gen server there. Observer. I would love to know under what definition of alphabetical this list is alphabetical. <laughs> uh, here it is. All right, come on, I found it and then it disappeared. There it is. Elixir.fetcher, and you'll see it's a gen server. Yeah, actually has no state, but that's okay. So you then say, okay, so I would like this now to be, um, I would like to run this uh, many, many times. I wanna make use of the parallelism in Elixir. So let's actually just quickly write some code to do that. Well, that was quick. Right, so there is code that runs fetcher 10 times and gets the result and re reports it back to us. And it does it 10 times and each one is in a separate process. So this thing should run really, really fast, right? So let's, uh, let's try that. All right. So I'm gonna run my fetcher, and then I'm gonna run that code called hello because that's what it came through when you create a new application. And, uh-oh, even though I have 10 separate processes going through there, I'm actually only, oh, I timed out even, right? I, there's nothing, it's all taking place serially, right? Because I have a named gen server here Right? There's only one of them, so you can only execute one at a time. What I really want to do is to have a pool. So, okay, I'm going to have a pool, I'm going to go get pool boy, and I'm going to go through all the machinations of creating a pool of these services, yeah? Anybody ever done that? Yeah? Well, it takes like, I don't know, the first time you do it, it probably takes a couple of hours to get right, and then after that, you're always juggling little things to get it right. Well, actually, all you really have to do is to say service.pooled, and we can set the pool parameters, so I'll say min to max three, say. And so that's gonna automatically create for me a pool boy set of um, processes that I can run. So if I go back to IEX over here, I'm gonna uh, reload fetcher. And it's, oh, and run it. And now it's running in parallel using a pool. So my point here is nothing to do with this particular code. My point is the process. My point is that we have been told that OTP is sacrosanct. And we have been told that gen server is the way to do things and we have to write our code using that particular style, right? With the handled calls and the tuples and all this kind of stuff. Underneath the covers, that's exactly what this is doing. It's generating all that code for you. But all you have to do is to write that. And all the rest, and why should you have to write any more? 
So I'm saying, let's start throwing away some of these preconceived ideas of how we should do things. See, I've spared you all of that stuff. So, it says, we clearly want to learn from the past. As an industry, we fail miserably when it comes to knowing our own history. Everybody here needs to learn a lot more about how things were done, because that will stop us reinventing everybody's mistakes yet again, yet again. But let's not worship it. Let's not cargo cult it. Let's not build gen service just because somebody else built gen service and it worked for them. Right? Let's think of alternative ways of achieving what it is we need to achieve. Right? We have the opportunity here to start something new. Learn from the past, don't worship it. But along the way, always remember, have some fun. Thank you. <laughs>